Isaiah chapter 5 and verse 20 says, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Uh, a former chaplain of the Kansas State Senate uh, submitted the following prayer at the beginning of one of the sessions. He said, Omniscient Father, help us to know who's telling the truth. One side tells us one thing and the other just the opposite. And if neither side is telling the truth, we'd like to know that too. And if each side is telling half the truth, give us the wisdom to put the right halves together. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs> that pretty much puts it right out there, doesn't it? I don't know about you, but uh, I find media today exhausting. Don't you? It's just exhausting. And, uh, you know, it, it, and, and the worst part of it all is it just seems like everybody's saying the same thing. You know, change a few words here and there, but most, for the most part, it's all the same. Um, but that is part of the strategy that media uses today, is to get us to the point where we basically tell ourselves, you know, the wolf is at the door, you might as well just let him in. Um, just, just resign yourself, just give up, just, you know, pull a, pull a Peter and just say, forget this, I'm going fishing. Does that register with anybody? Okay. But before we do that, we have to understand that the battle is often won or lost through an assault on words. I don't know who wrote it. I should know who wrote it because I like to say it a lot. But uh, somebody uh, very wisely said a long time ago, the pen is mightier than the sword. Huh? Shakespeare? Could very well be. Yeah. And it's true. Ultimately, a war on words is a war on ideas. The radical left wants to use words not just to win the debate, but to completely cancel the debate. And uh, they want to destroy the influence of those who might disagree with them. And they want to use words to limit and even control our thoughts. This is how propaganda works. And we are living in, an, in a new age of overt propaganda. Now, bear in mind that the purpose for propaganda is to reshape people's view of reality by reimagining reality. And they do that by appealing to human desires uh, and to create, uh, if, a, if you will, a parallel universe where ideas create facts and those things are followed then by hollow promises. Ideas don't create facts. They don't. But that's what they want us to believe. If you repeat an ideology often enough, you're going to get somebody to believe it as fact. The goal, of course, is power and control and manipulation to uh, indoctrinate the masses. And uh, it, is, uh, it is an issue. It, it's something that, um, that people will use uh, and, and they'll sell it to us by saying that it is uh, part of a commitment to what is best for the people. 
And if we give in to that and just kind of give up and say, oh, well, you know, they, they're doing what they think is best, then what ends up happening is people uh, suspend their judgment and they set aside what they know to be true uh, and they just join with the masses. Um, what we end up having is what we saw with COVID, herd instinct. Um, so powerful that, that very, very few will ever have the courage to stand up against what is being uh, proposed. Uh, Joseph Goebbels. Anybody know who Goebbels was? Hmm? Yes. Joseph Goebbels was Hitler's propaganda czar, if you want to call him, uh, and uh, a minister of propaganda. This is what he said. I put it here on your notes. Arguments must be crude, clear, and forcible, and appeal to emotions and instincts, not to the intellect. Truth is unimportant and even subordinate to the tactics and psychology of convenient lies. Psychology being a reference to emotions that are being inflamed to bypass the mind in order to win the hearts of the people. Facts are not relevant. Enraged feelings will turn the masses into willing followers. If you have ever watched Hitler give a speech, he starts out very soft-spoken, leaves room for dramatic pauses. And before you know it, he winds up and he winds up and by the end of his speech, he's screaming and shouting and he has whipped up the crowd into a mass hysteria. If nothing else, as evil as that person was, he was a master communicator. Very good communicator. Uh, it creates a problem. All of us are susceptible to propaganda. We, we know this because we sometimes listen to things with our hearts rather than listening to things with our minds. Uh, and, and, and truth be told, uh, oftentimes our human nature makes us focus on what we want to hear. <laughs> and so we tune into things that we want to hear instead of getting, you know, both sides of an issue. Um, Craig uh, Groeschel uh, is an author, pastor, and he talks about something called cognitive bias. And he describes how we look at reality through a set of glasses that really represent our predetermined perspective, and then we find the information that we're looking for, just like a vulture looks for a certain type of food and a hummingbird looks for a certain type of food, not necessarily the same. Ask yourself, what news sources do I listen to, if any? <laughs> the truth is this, 90% of the time, if not more, we listen to people who agree with us. And we shun people who don't disagree with us. Now, when it comes to regular news, how many of you have your uh, TV tuned to CNN all the time? Because they are just so factual, right? How many of us listen to Fox News, right? Okay, there's a slim group of hands, brave souls that you are, okay? How many of you listen to David Muir, ABC News, okay? If I have to listen to one of the main networks, I like him. He's not as out there as... Lester Holt and all those others. But that's my bias, you see. You know, the Bible says, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. Jesus said that. And what he's saying there is that there's nobody as deaf as someone whose heart is not open to the truth. 
Whenever you see that, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. That's basically what he's saying. <laughs> you know, there's nobody as deaf as somebody whose heart is not open to the truth. And that is why the Bible warns us so often about the dangers of having a hard heart. Because the mind is only going to receive that which is approved by the heart. Um, and this explains why uh, propaganda is so dangerous. It is because it appeals to our emotions. And as much as possible, it avoids facts. The desire to believe something is more powerful than any rational argument. Let me give you an example. In our first church, we had uh, a, a lady who attended church, and her husband passed away, and I did his funeral, and she stopped coming. And, you know, I, I figured, well, it's, it's difficult, you know, after someone has passed away to be out in public, and so she needs time. Understand that, you know. Would send, you know, a couple of notes, different things. But this went on for quite some time. So after a couple of months, uh, I went to see her one day. And she was out in the yard, and she was gardening, and we were talking. And uh, uh, I, I, I just, I had mentioned, uh, you know, we... We miss you. We miss you, church. And uh, how, how are you doing? Oh, well, um, I've been attending, and she named another church in town. And I was kind of like slapped in the face, you know. It was kind of like, whoa. You know, we helped you through the hard times and all of this. And, 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 and I said, uh, well, have you been offended? Have you been hurt by some, somebody said something to you? Oh, no, no, no. Um, there's just some things, you know, uh, about the church that, uh, that I just can't uh, agree with, meaning our church. And I said, well, would you care to elaborate? Long story short, she went on to tell me that she, um, um, she didn't believe that... Uh, No, I get that wrong. Um, the new church that she was attending uh, preached uh, baptismal regeneration. That you are saved by being baptized. Okay? And um, since her husband had been baptized as a child, uh, if she attended that church and believed what they believed, um, then she would know that her husband was in heaven. And it just about broke my heart because she's believing a lie. She's choosing to believe a lie even when she knows the truth because she knew. I mean, I had taught it. I, I teach it all the time. The baptism did not save us. Um, but in this particular uh, church, um, they, they did believe that and they taught that. And so that made her husband's eternity that much more palatable for her, uh, choosing to believe something else. You know, now that's on, you know, on a religious psych circle, you know, in, in church circles kind of a thing, example of what we're talking about. But, you know, the, the, the bigger example, of course, is everywhere, isn't it? I mean, we, we, we know this, we see this uh, all, all over the place. Um, and so that's what he's talking about here with this whole idea of cognitive uh, bias, uh, uh, appealing to our emotions and avoiding um, facts. Um, we have all met people where the facts just don't matter. 
They don't matter. You know, have you ever run into a case where the old adage is true, blood is thicker than water? Hmm? What does that mean, by the way? Okay. Mm -hmm. Ah, family. Yep. We had a situation in a church one time where it was horrible and very unfortunate and ended up causing a huge split explosion in the church where I had a deacon uh, who was um, heavily involved in pornography uh, and was uh, found guilty of having multiple affairs. And um, his wife had done her due diligence and had downloaded all of his emails and printed them off between he and these other women. And so I had in my hand the cold, hard facts. Um, and, and it was such a huge deal because this was four generations deep in the church. Four generations deep. His, his grandfather had been the founding pastor of the church. Uh, and, uh, you know, so not only his grandfather, um, who, you know, I followed, uh, but, um, you know, his parents, himself, and his children. And so this just went kaboom. And, you know, when the elders and I went to um, talk to his mother, uh, and, and she said, I don't believe it. You know, I pulled out these things and I said, here it is. And she said, I don't care whether it's true or not. He's my son and I'm going to stand behind him. Blood's thicker than water. You know, people choose irrational things even when the facts contradict because we get caught up in emotional, the emotion of it all. And it's a, it's a hard, hard reality. Um, we're, not, we're not even, our society is not even remotely open to the possibility of being wrong about something. No, you're wrong. Max, you're wrong because you don't agree with me. How dare you be such a bigot toward me, Max? Max has got broad shoulders. He can handle it. Yeah. That's right. That's right. He's going to let the air out of my tires one of these days or something. Uh, did anybody in school ever read George Orwell's 1984? Yeah, you read it, Kim? Mm -hmm. Pretty interesting, isn't it? Uh, it's, a, it's a fictitious novel uh, about the future. And, you know, if you have the time, I would encourage you to read 1984 because it is what we are living today. Now, of course, it was written way, way back before 1984. 1984 was a futuristic date at the time that it was written. Um, but it is what we are living in our society today. Uh, the, the whole gist of uh, 1984 is a depiction of a state, a country, um, where anyone who dares to think differently is rewarded with torture, uh, and where people are monitored every second of the day, and where um, party propaganda trumps free speech, and thought is a sobering reminder of uh, the evils of unaccountable uh, governments. So, um, you know, it's all accomplished by conditioning the public uh, making clear what is acceptable to say and what is not acceptable to say and um, what 
cannot be said, shouldn't even be thought. By the way, that's what's being pumped out of our universities these days. So watch out. As soon as the next two rounds of graduating classes get out in our society, you think you've seen wokeism before. You ain't seen nothing yet. Um, word control is intended to bring about thought control. Um, the, 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 the gist is uh, don't allow your mind to think thoughts that are not within acceptable verbal guidelines. Acceptable verbal guidelines. Uh, uh, right along there with Orwell was another guy named Aldous Huxley. He wrote a book called Brave New World, and he also uh, wrote a fictitious uh, account of a totalitarian state. Uh, and, uh, and, and this is what he said, uh, a really efficient totalitarian state would be one in which the all-powerful executive of political bosses and their army of managers control a population of slaves who do not have to be coerced because they love their slavery. To make them love it is the task that is assigned in present-day totalitarian states to ministries of propaganda, newspaper editors, and school teachers. That's the world that we're living in right now. In this case, Booker T. Washington was heroic when he said, a lie doesn't become truth and wrong doesn't become right and evil doesn't become good just because it's accepted by the majority. You know, one of the things that I made mention of at the funeral service yesterday, uh, I, I, it just kind of felt like I needed to put it right out there. And so I said something to the effect, you may not choose to believe these things as being true. Uh, and, and if I'm wrong, well, I haven't really lost out on that much. But if I am right, where does that leave you? So, yeah. Um, there are six ways in which uh, propaganda is, uh, uh, is uh, manipulating language. And uh, we're going to get into the first part of this uh, today. Uh, the use of evocative slogans. Evocative slogans. All political campaigns have a slogan, right? Uh, when I was a little boy, my uh, neighbor up the road uh, was the governor. And uh, when he was running for office, his slogan was, Axe the tax, vote Thompson for governor. And uh, I still have those old campaign buttons laying around somewhere. Axe the tax. And uh, that's one of the reasons why New Hampshire still has no sales tax. It's one of the few states that has no sales tax. Don't worry, they get all of their money through state-run liquor stores instead. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, ax the tax. Can you think of any other slogans that we've heard in recent days? Hmm? Are there any other slogans out there? MAGA. MAGA. Mm -hmm. Make America great again. My body, my choice. Yes. Love is love. Build back better. There we go. Any others? Fix the roads. Okay. How about, how about, you deserve a break today. Have it your way. Just do it. Just say no, Nancy Reagan. Any others can you think of? You do you. Anything else? Where's the beef? Yeah. Here's one. Black Lives Matter. 
Well, they do, don't they? As a matter of fact, all lives matter. All black lives matter. Sure. So on and on and on again, you know, the, 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 the fight for social justice, social justice, it almost sounds like you're saying the Pledge of Allegiance, right? Uh, it just seems like something that every Christian ought to support, social justice. Uh, and, and, and you just need to take the time to unpack what social justice refers to and what it means. You know, when Hitler starved uh, children, he called it putting them on a low-calorie diet. Uh, when, uh, when they were killing the Jews, they were cleansing the land. Euthanasia was considered a compassionate use of medical therapy. Propaganda is telling people what they want to hear and then giving them what you want them to believe. We're not killing grandma. We're ending life with dignity. On and on and on. Another way that uh, propaganda manipulates language is by using language to create reality. Now, when God did it, it was the real deal. Uh, we're going to find out about that next week. God said, let there be light, and there was light. Um, but people deceive themselves all the time thinking that they can do the exact same thing. Uh, and it le they, they, they lead us into darkness and they call it light. And if they see any glimmers of light, well, then they call that darkness. Um, they don't use language to describe reality. They use language to create reality. Again, back to Orwell's 1984. Um, freedom is slavery. War is peace. Uh, there, was, uh, there was a character in the book. Susan, did you ever read the book, George Orwell, 1984? No? Okay. We're just trying to see if anybody's familiar with that. Um, uh, there's a main character in the book called Big Brother. And so whenever we talk about, you know, in our social context, whenever we talk about Big Brother's watching, it's a reference to Orwell's book. That's where that originated from. In the book, Big Brother's goal is a population that is so dependent on government that it wants to be controlled. Uh, and the Ministry of Love, there's a good one for you, uh, that's what we need. We need Biden needs to, don't say it too loud, he might be listening. Biden needs a love czar, don't you think? We ought to have a love czar. Huh. The ministry of love uh, will lovingly indoctrinate anyone who refuses to submit. Uh, and so the government, in essence, in the book is saying indoctrination is loving because we say it is. <clears throat> Anybody ever heard of a guy named George Floyd? Hmm? George Floyd, all right? May he rest in peace. Go stand before his statue, moment of silence. Um, you can remember, can't you, seeing reporters standing in front of burning cars and burning buildings behind them saying that these are what? Peaceful demonstrations. Largely peaceful demonstrations. So, so riots now can be defined as peaceful looting. And we can, we can see that as, as being called redistributive justice. Okay? We're not stealing. This is redistributive justice, Jerry. Yes. Yeah, it sure does. Um, people who break the law and enter the United States illegally are not illegal immigrants. They are simply undocumented workers. 
And a criminal is a person who has issues with the law. He's not a criminal. He just has issues with the law, Max. All right? So what is happening? What we're seeing here is an attempt to use words to reorder reality. Um, and, and, you know, that, that man, Ellie, that man that you see over there who is um, competing in sports, that's actually a woman. It's not a man. You know? Uh, close your eyes to all of the biological reality and reject common sense and just agree that he is a woman. Um, because after all, he said he was. We're, we're seeing it. Yes. So simple by the power of speech. Um, we, 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 we find this endless number of realities can be created. Uh, uh, tolerance is nothing more than forced compliance. Again, words are not used to describe reality, but to create reality when it comes to propaganda. Any professor who rails against white people is actually seen as a hero who is fighting racism. A university that doesn't allow a conservative to speak on campus does so in the interest of tolerance. Uh, the mother who kills their preborn infant is simply making a health care decision. And on and on and on. Here's a good one. Drag queens are artists. They are artists that should be welcome to libraries to speak to children. Drag is art, writes Jane, uh, Jaden Amos, reporter for NPR. It's an outlet for artistic expression, not just for the queens and kings who perform, but also for the designers, makeup artists, hairstylists, and photographers working with them behind the scenes to share their artistry as well. So what's there not to like in that? I, uh, Austin, I'm going to, I'm going to embarrass you, okay? Just tell me ahead of time. Because that's the kind of guy I am. I just fail like that. Okay. Uh, Austin and I had lunch the other day. And uh, uh, I know that Austin likes to um, do computer programming. It's one of his hobbies. You know, he makes games and stuff. You know, it's way over my head. But in the process of our conversation, he's telling me about this new, um, I won't call it a software, I don't know what really to call it. What would you call it? Yes, yeah. Okay, some kind of an engine. Um, some kind of an engine that uh, allows you to, um, to make something um, without cutting and pasting. Uh, and, and he was showing me um, um, a YouTube video that was completely made uh, using this particular uh, software and stuff. And I'm looking at that and I'm saying, okay, where, and I said to him, where did they film this? And he said, they didn't film it anywhere. It's not filmed. It's just made. I said, what do you mean it's made? You know, well, then, out of the goodness of his heart, he had to dumb it down for me uh, and basically said, well, it's, it's, you know, you program it, you do this, you do that, and it forms this, you know, and there was a famous actor that was part of it, and I said, oh, that's so-and-so. He said, no, it's not. That, that's not so-and-so. That's not a picture of him. That's not this. That's not that. Somebody made it. And it looked like it was just a clip from uh, a movie that had been produced or something along those lines. And I said, you mean to tell me that none of that exists? He said, that's right. 
none of it exists. It's not real. And I said, that's pretty scary. What does that do to um, evidence in a court of law? when you have quote-unquote video cam footing, footage of such and such happening, and on and on and on. Well, he assured me there's a way to trace that, you know, to find the originator, um, but you have to know what it is you're looking for. But the average person doesn't know that stuff. So, you know, all of these things that, 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 are, that are out there, and that's not to say that, you know, all of that stuff is bad because some of it's really pretty cool things that you can do. Um, but just like anything else, it can be used for evil or for good purposes. Well, um, yes, but this is even more so than that. You're talking about you're talking about a movie that's like uh, an actor doing something in front of a green screen, okay? Or that they put a scene behind them and it makes them look like a, this. This is even beyond that. There's no green screen. The whole thing is completely made up out of nothing. Yeah, yeah, it's amazing. Probably. Probably. There's. There's, there's, a, there's a way. I'm sure there's a way. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, uh, real quickly, the third, uh, third way to manipulate is uh, using words to suppress the debate. A lot of colleges and universities do this. Um, they are narrowing what is considered permissible speech. And what ends up happening is that the students just kind of get frustrated and give up and sit there in silence uh, and leaves them very unsure of what they can say and what they cannot say for fear of um, pass-fail. Word control means thought control. And the goal is to put parameters around what people can say so that eventually they will apply those same parameters not only to what they say, but also to what they think. If you don't believe it, just try and express a different point of view in front of others and see what happens. Right? I mean, we all know that there are two things you don't talk about at Thanksgiving dinner, right? Jesus and politics. You know, so go ahead and open that can if you, if you decide you want to <laughs> have some fireworks. <laughs> yeah, right, right. Yep. Brandeis University recently posted a list of offensive words uh, urging students and faculty to stop using words and phrases like picnic, trigger warning, or rule of thumb because of what a campus counseling service calls their links to violence and power to reinforce systems of oppression. Uh, other words that were flagged include freshman, victim, survivor, addict, disabled person, policeman, and on and on and on and on. If there's a barber shop in your area, they should not have a sign that says walk-ins welcome because some people are in wheelchairs. And they might be offended and feel excluded. Uh, University of Michigan ITS department compiled a similar dictionary of acceptable terms. Uh, other universities are doing the same thing. Uh, the United Nations has said uh, that the word chairman should no longer be used. PETA, we know PETA, right? People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals, have urged that baseball replace the term bullpen. <laughs> Replace the term bullpen with arm barn out of consideration for the bovine species. You might offend the bull. There you go. You can't even do that anymore. Right. Because some bulls might not have horns. Right. 
The reason is not to elevate the conversation. The reason is to silence the conversation. The goal is not only deny free speech, but to produce students who graduate with ideological conformity and those who don't comply with that guideline are going to be intimidated because some unapproved word or phrase might trigger somebody else. A Christian professor at a state university said that when she expressed a Christian opinion uh, in a meeting, she was told by somebody, quote, I don't feel safe around you. Or, quote, what you say does me harm. And her response was, what do you say to, if someone says they don't feel safe around you? How do you, how do you roll with that? And she answered her own question by basically saying the discussion just ends. So, Josh, the next time you have an argument with your kids, just look at them and say, I don't feel safe around you. And that's the end of it. <laughs> yes, yes. Yep. yep. Oh... Sad things, sad things. Um, but uh, we're going to stop here today, and uh, we'll pick it up next time. Any thoughts, comments? Amen. You know, if nothing else, we all ought to be like somewhat informative of people to people when... Um, you know, when we feel compelled to share some truth that might be offensive to others. You know, it's kind of like the kind of like the Quaker farmer who heard a noise uh, at night and grabbed his shotgun and uh, went to the top of the stairs and turned the light on and there was a thief at the bottom of the stairs who looked up at him and the Quaker says, friend, I mean thee no harm but thou standest where I am about to shoot. At least let them know that it's coming, right? That's a joke. You can think about it on the way. Think about it on the way home, but don't drive off the road. All right? We're done.